Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all to the first Winning Conversations webinar hosted by the Women in Neuromodulation Committee of the North American Neuromodulation Society. I'm so excited. We have a wonderful number of you who are joining us tonight, and we have an amazing uh, panel of faculty. Um, and I, I really applaud all of you for joining us about a topic such as imposter syndrome. You're used to Nan's doing very um, technical webinars that are focused on the technologies that we implement to patients and um, very strong research that we do um, to the clinical work that we're all very dedicated to. But there are other elements that become the glue which affect how our careers develop. And imposter syndrome is one of those things that I think we all have experienced from time to time. You know, it's the feeling that regardless of your accomplishments, uh, achievements, or credentials, that your worth or your contributions are not worthy of where you have, have found yourself. So that might be when you're starting a new job or when you're joining a new practice. Um, and so, you know, what our conversation tonight is to kind of shed light to some of these um, moments in our careers where we, we sympathize with the feeling of imposter syndrome, to identify examples that physicians may experience at a variety levels of experience, and to develop some constructive strategies, how we as a community can address imposter syndrome, both as a whole and also on an individual level. These are our panelists. I'm gonna let each one of them introduce themselves and tell you about briefly where they practice. But I would like to highlight one of our panelists who is not a physician. She is a brilliant PhD student. And um, that is Dr. Jasmine Sanders, who is a sociology PhD student and mixed methods researcher at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research centers on organizational organizational inequality culture and workplace policies and practices. Dr. Sanders obtained her master's in sociology and education from Teachers College, Columbia University. She also has a bachelor's in English from Spelman College. Next slide. So this is gonna be a 90 minute webinar and we're gonna ask you all to be in a listen only mode. If you have any questions or any comments, please type them in the chat box and we will certainly bring them to the rest of the group. Um, please share your thoughts, experiences, and any comments that you may have. And this webinar is certainly going to be better with your contribution, so I definitely encourage you to do that. This webinar will be recorded and will be accessible at neuromodulation.org. So this is a very safe environment. So the physicians who have joined us tonight are going to share some very personal experiences from their training um, and from their practice. Um, and, you know, we want to keep it a, a positive environment. Um, and at the same time, none of the stories or advice that's given tonight is meant to give you a prescriptive way and how to handle um, imposter syndrome. Um, it, it is an example of how individuals have handled it in their own career. Um, and the really the goal is to highlight that imposter syndrome really applies to all of us. Next slide. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jasmine Sanders. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel, for that amazing introduction. Um, so before we jump into what imposter syndrome is and isn't, I want you to stretch your imaginations a bit and picture yourself in a situation. So I'm originally from Alabama, and I am a big sports fan, but hopefully this will make sense given March Madness and all the basketball tournament play happening right now. But let's just say you're on an intramural basketball team and you are preparing for your next game. You all have been working really hard and practicing over time because you heard this was a really great team you're up against. So after two a day practices, practicing in the morning and the evening, running plays all week, you and your team are feeling really confident. You just know you're gonna go out there and crush it at the game. So game time runs around, rolls around, there are tons of fans in the stands, and your opponents come out of the locker room and out walks Michael Jordan, Shaquille O'Neal, Steph Curry, Sue Bird, and Candace Parker. Quick, what are your initial thoughts? What are your reactions? I can imagine 
imagine that despite you and your team hard work and all of the preparation that you have put into this game, you probably feel extremely overwhelmed, extremely underprepared, and like you should absolutely not be playing in that game against NBA and WNBA stars. So this is just a quick lens into what imposter syndrome feels like. So imposter syndrome is not a new term. Dr. Patel um, highlighted that it surfaces that when, even though you have all the accomplishments, the achievements, the credentials to match where you are, you feel as if your contributions and skills are insufficient and inadequate compared to others. Therefore, you feel like an imposter, very much like you are an intramural team playing up against NBA and WNBA stars. So as we mentioned, Imposter syndrome is not new. The term imposter phenomenon was actually coined in 1978 by two psychologists at Georgia State University. So this is definitely something that while it may be new and you may be hearing about it for the first time, it's certainly been around for a long time and people have been experiencing it either in their workplaces or in different contexts for nearly 30 years or over 30 years. Um, what's really specific about imposter syndrome, apart from maybe just anxiety or second guessing, is that people express that they will feel like they've been found out or that they will be exposed as a fraud. So they feel like, oh man, everyone's going to figure out that I did not deserve to be here, that all of my degrees are a fraud, that I just happen to be here by luck or chance or circumstance. I just know the right people. And so as a result, it feels as if all their accomplishments um, are null and void because they did not earn them. They'll be found out as a fraud. And also it's important to recognize that imposter syndrome is context and time specific. So just because you may experience imposter syndrome in one specific situation or environment doesn't mean that you'll experience it everywhere. Um, and so you may feel like an imposter in one space and an expert um, in another. And so it really depends on the space in which you're in and not the person in particular. And that is something I will continue to emphasize um, because I think it's really important to recognize that it has very little to do with the person experiencing imposter syndrome and a lot to do with the environment that has been created that allows the person to feel as if they're an imposter. So I wanna to talk to you a couple of myths that go along with imposter syndrome. So the first one is that only women experience imposter syndrome. We hear it a lot like, oh, that is such a women's or woman specific experience that men don't get imposter syndrome. And that is an absolute myth. Um, the fact is that imposter syndrome is actually a fairly universal feeling of discomfort, second guessing or anxiety. So obviously, traditional workplaces can certainly exacerbate these feelings of otherness um, and imposter syndrome for employees, particularly from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, so women, people of color, people from differing socioeconomic backgrounds, people with differing abil abilities, um, neurodiverse employees may certainly experience imposter syndrome at higher rates. Um, because workplaces were not necessarily created for, for a lot of folks to feel inclusive or to feel as if their contributions deeply matter and are valued. And so certainly women and underrepresented um, populations and people from differing backgrounds may experience imposter syndrome at a higher rate or at higher intensity. However, everyone, men, women, everyone can experience imposter syndrome and it's solely not um, a women's experience. The second myth is that imposter syndrome is just a personal problem. They just need to figure it out, build some self-confidence and get over it. Like everyone experiences doubting, everyone experiences second guessing, get over it. This is a personal problem. That is absolutely a myth. And this is something, again, I want to emphasize because imposter syndrome has very little to do with the person and more to do with the environment. So the solution is not fixing this person or telling them to get more self-confidence and self-esteem. Um, it's really understanding and interrogating the practices and policies, either at your workplace, your home environment, whatever environment you're in, 
understanding what are the norms, what are the practices that we have in place that are allowing people to feel as if their contributions are um, not valued or if, as if they're not worthy? Um, why are we creating a space in which people feel like um, they can't or they're not able to live up to their best selves or they don't have um, the credentials that they need to be their best selves? Um, and so I think hopefully, uh, and one of my concerns with the term imposter syndrome is that it does seem to place the onus on the imposter or the person. Um, I like to maybe use the term of institutional othering because it places the responsibility on the institution or the context and the environment that's actually doing the othering or actually doing the work of marginalizing people. Um, and so I think that's a really helpful reframe if we're thinking about imposter syndrome. It's to not place the responsibility on the person who's experiencing, experiencing it, but really think about what are the systems in place, what are the practices in place at this workplace um, that may be allowing uh, this person to feel as if they can't contribute in a way that is meaningful? What are the, the systems that are in place that are allowing people to feel as if they aren't confident in the tasks and the skills which we know they have um, tons of experience and accomplishments in? Um, so take the onus off the person and put it on the institution or the organization or the space um, to think about ways in which we can create a more inclusive um, and value-based um, organization. And then the last myth I want to highlight, um, and this is similar to myth two, but you know, everyone has doubts and second guesses themselves. This isn't a syndrome. This is just, you know, life. Like this isn't a phenomenon. This is something we all experience, or that, you know, who cares if they experience it? Um, and so again, because imposter syndrome isn't medically diagnosed, sometimes people can um, dismiss it or discount those feelings. Um, but just because it isn't medically diagnosed does not mean it is not real. It is a very real experience for the people who have gone through imposter syndrome. Um, and I think you would feel like it is a very real experience if you walked into your intramural game and you had to play one-on-one -on -one with Michael Jordan. It becomes very real that like, I am not cut, up for, cut out for this. Um, and so even if you haven't experienced it, doesn't mean it isn't real. And we have to make sure that we don't discount these experiences in others. And again, put the focus and the laser on the organization and the context to understand what are we doing? How am I operating? How is this organization operating that's creating a space that allows people not to feel um, like they're valued or that they're worthy? So that's just a little quick kickoff to imposter syndrome. And hopefully um, this has been a way to debunk some of those myths that have been um, not only popping up on the internet and in conversations, but certainly in our society more broadly. Thank you so much, Jasmine. That was absolutely on point with the audience that are that is here tonight. Um, you really kind of simplified what it is. You know, something I've often thought about is, you know, how do you ex get, explain or get somebody's headspace around what imposter syndrome is? And I was reading Shonda Rhimes' book, um, The Year of Yes, and she talks about something being a first only different. And I think all of us can relate, you know, in our careers that we have done something, we're the first to do something, or it was the first time we ever did something, and we felt different, and that difference felt uncomfortable. Um, you know, in her book, she talks about first only different, and it, it speaks to, you know, minorities and marginalized groups within society. However, I really think that this is something that resonates with everyone, and I, I really appreciate what you said about looking at the cultural uh, context, and look at looking how the culture may feed you know, that that feeling of um, inadequacy by the individual. And what I would challenge us to think as we listen to the stories tonight is that how we may subconsciously absorb the nor social norm atmosphere. So there are social norms that we have accepted and sometimes that inadvertently affects individuals um, in terms of their day-to-day, -day, you know, career as they're moving through their training early in their career advanced in their career and then when they are in 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 a position to you know be a residency or fellowship program director themselves so with that i'm going to turn it over to our two um 
wonderful speakers tonight, Cha Hei Singh and Kristen Powers, who are both uh, fellows in training, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Chahat Singh and I'm a fellow at uh, Zucker School of Medicine, Northwell Health uh, here in New York. So I just wanted to share a few anecdotal and non-anecdotal experiences um, that I've had in my clinical training. Uh, so in all of my years of training, I've often felt it's been difficult to get feedback uh, from my male men mentors. I would try. If I had struggled with a procedure or had difficulty in grasping a concept, I'd often find a time that was appropriate and initiate conversations such as, you know, how could I have done that differently or what could I do to improve? And sometimes the feedback was helpful and sometimes the feedback wasn't. Uh, the times that it wasn't happened a lot more than the times that it was. Oftentimes vague statements um, in terms of, you know, it'll come with time, it comes with experience, um, you'll just learn it over time. Uh, and it wasn't until I started seeing it play out in front of me in the presence of male colleagues that were at the same level of training that I started to feel that maybe there was an apparent difference and maybe a real difference. Um, I remember a time or rather multiple times that when I had first started learning, I um, had worked with one particular attending and I always felt that I was racing against a clock, that if I didn't do something fast enough, that I'd inevitably be interrupted and I just wouldn't have the chance to you know, make the mistakes that I needed to to do to learn the procedure, um, and just gotten the the opportunity to to uh, to do the procedure, I suppose. And I was often told it was you know it was in the interest of patient comfort or that time was of the essence. And I remember this time when I was on a bigger case with a male colleague. Sometimes uh, we were scrubbing in together and this attending was supervising and directing us. Um, I had been told to go first in, in the procedure and I had tried. It was almost as if I had a mental fumble with this attending in particular before I had a physical fumble. But I, would, I tried and I struggled and it almost felt within minutes immediately um, instead of being provided guidance and redirection and feedback that you know the attending had told my male colleague to uh to take over and it wasn't as if he it was seamless or that he had struggled any less or struggled any more but that he had been afforded the time and been also been talked through the procedure and that it to me didn't felt that he was racing against this imaginary clock. And for me in those experiences, it's created a lack of sometimes self-confidence, um, inadequacy, sometimes self-doubt. And it sits in the back of your head, kind of like a constant ache. And a part of us as physicians, I feel like, are always to some degree trying to overachieve and I've always really wanted to overachieve in that regard that you know could I be able to do a procedure uninterrupted or get the feedback that I wanted um, on how to perfect a procedure so that I can do as well as I as a male counterpart um, it's it's hard when you know to advance sometimes when you aren't afforded that same feedback or that same time so I just wanted to take the opportunity to kind of shed light on um, some of the experiences that I had uh, for, for procedural feedback during my clinical years. So I'm going to hand it over to Kristen Powers. Uh, okay. 
Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Kristen Powers. I am a current fellow at UCSF. Um, and I think I definitely do suffer from imposter syndrome. Um, I think this past year in the last part of my training, um, kind of as I'm nearing the end of my fellowship, it was really the first time I really started to have more th negative thoughts around myself, um, around my role in pain medicine and kind of my future in the medical career in general. Um, and so when Dr. Patel kind of posed this question to us at um, one of our WIN meetings um, about kind of my experience with imposter syndrome or um, what she thought contributed to me developing this, I immediately knew it was something that I was actively struggling with. Um, and so for me, um, I think personally the largest contributing factor and the thing that I definitely ruminate on the most are um, formal evaluations that I have received kind of throughout training. And um, I feel like they don't really have the positive effect of helping me kind of reflect and um, change for the better. Um, they really, um, you know, make me struggle with self-confidence and make me question if I'm adequate to succeed in this field. Um, and so overall, I would just like to say that my residency and my fellowship have largely been extremely positive experiences. And if I were talking to people kind of entering the field, I would hands down recommend both my residency and my fellowship program. And so I do in no mean, and I in no way mean to kind of speak poorly about them. It's just kind of my experience. And I think it's something that maybe a lot of people can relate to. Um, so in residency, for example, we had daily anonymized um, evaluations with um, numeric scores as well as a section for comments. Um, and so basically every day the attending that you would work with would fill out an evaluation about you. And then kind of every 60 or 90 days you would get an email from an administrative personnel and it would say, it would just have the comments listed, 90 comments of what people thought about you, attendings in the department and no names attached to them. And I would say 95% um, of them overall were very positive, but I think one of the things that really struck me the most was how little the critiques that I received focused on clinical competency. Um, I really would never receive critiques kind of commenting on procedural skills or my thought process in handling a complicated patient or kind of my actions in the operating room. Um, all the negative received feedback I think I've received has always been focused on my personality or the way that I carry myself. And I think as I kind of reflected back on this for this talk and also over this past year, um, I think I can kind of explain it a little bit. I think early in my career, um, I was entering into a, you know, a new hospital where I knew no one. I would try and be um, overly nice, overly accommodating, overly friendly. I think as a lot of females in this field do, because I wanted to feel like I, you know, I wanted to build good connections. Um, and then I would get these negative evaluations saying, um, you know, you need to be more assertive. You need to work on your confidence. Um, the certain things that you say in the OR, um, you know, make you seem less intelligent. I had one saying um, that I seemed like I had anxiety. Um, and so then I actually talked to my program director about them. And then I was trying to work on, you know, seeming more assertive in the OR um, and um, then and being more confident. And then I started to get, um, you know, some random evaluation saying, I didn't seem happy enough at work. I didn't smile enough. I got one that said I had a chip on my shoulder. Um, and then this year in applying for jobs, I overheard a conversation about me when people were kind of talking about my candidacy for an employment opportunity. And I got um, just a casual comment that I overheard that I was high maintenance. And um, I do wanna just kind of give myself like a little bit of, um, a vote of support or something. Um, I'm, you know, I was largely a well-liked resident. Um, I haven't really struggled, you know, in a lot of these aspects. And so these are kind of just one-off comments that are said um, never to my face um, and um, kind of always kind of in these anonymized formats or casually in discussions that um, I have personally just really struggled with. 
And so this year, um, when I received, you know, I heard that other comment, um, I just started to reflect so much on kind of all of my um, feedback that I'd received. And I started to feel like I wasn't really cut out for the field. Um, maybe like I didn't have the thick skin I thought I did. Um, and then I really started to think like there's something wrong with me or my personality, my interpersonal communication skills, like maybe I am these things. Um, and so I have really just struggled with it this, that this year and it's become apparent to like my family, my significant other, um, even Lawrence, um, Lawrence Poré, who's one of my mentors at UCSF, you know, we've talked about it as well. Um, and I think I'm just trying to figure out kind of how I should really be carrying myself as a female in this field. And I'm trying to um, determine if what the right path is for me, because one thing I know for certain is I really want to be judged on my clinical competency and I want really clear um, kind of goals and marks for which I will be evaluated against. And um, I almost have this feeling now that the only way to really have control over that is um, is to kind of be in private practice or to work for myself um, where, you know, I'm my marker and my judge of my own success. Um, I think also uh, I don't ever kind of want to dismiss feedback either. And so it's been a very self-reflective process and something that um, I think I'm still working through, um, but definitely just a very relevant topic for me, especially at this stage in my career, kind of as I'm finally finishing up and um, going to start working, um, you know, as an attending. And so um, I appreciate um, the webinar and allowing me to participate. Thank you both for um, sharing your story. If you, if all of our panelists could come on and, and you know, we want to just make some comments and ask a few questions before we move on to the next segment. What I, I wanted to say to both of you, first of all, thank you so much for being so brave for coming on and, you know, sharing your experiences, particularly because you are in training right now and because your faculty are also on this webinar. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, the first thing question that I have to both of you is how do you think these experiences have changed your focus during your fellowship in terms of your day to day? In terms of the thoughts that you have and the things you focus on in your training? Um, both yeah, talk. Go ahead. Kristen. <laughs> you can go ahead. Thanks. Uh, so to echo a little bit of uh, what Kristen said and a little bit of what I say, what I had said earlier, um, I have, I feel like it does impact how I come across um, on a day to day. Um, and generally I'm a very positive person and, um, sorry. It impacts me on a day to day, so outwardly, um, and it makes me feel like I, you know, lack self confidence when I don't, and it impacts me in my ability to perform. So I'm gonna let Kristen take over while I compose. <laughs> oh, I mean, my heart kind of breaks for you because um, I think like we've all felt that, and. Um, it just takes a lot of vulnerability to kind of show emotion like that. And so um, we've all felt that whether we're kind of, you know, spewing it on a webinar or not, and um, we're all here with you and we support you. Um, I think for me, it just kind of affects my ability to kind of stay positive and excited at work um, and to really have um, a a good attitude kind of coming into work sometimes like I'm feeling like you know I'm trying I'm doing all the right things and maybe it's just not enough and I'm not enough and so what am I doing and um, is this really kind of the right thing for me and I think um, it's noticeable sometimes um, definitely like you know I was working with Lawrence and I mean my confidence has come up and so um, and Lawrence has been such a fabulous mentor but 
it's noticeable because I question myself, like I don't kind of speak up and, you know, there's been discussions where you know the answer, like when I probe you or press you about it, you'll say the right thing, but you're not coming out with it right away. And I'm like, yeah, I don't, I just like, don't want to speak up first or I don't want to act like I'm a know-it-all or, you know, it's just, it's these things where you're questioning who you are as a person and it's making you almost try and change your personality, which is innate to who you are and you really can't change it. And so, but then no, you're Kristen, just holding yeah. back and not being yourself. Kristen, I, I think that's an, a very important, um, and I want all of our panelists to jump in, but the one thing I just had to say to both of you is that, you know, thank you so much for being so brave again, for sharing these stories and being so honest and, and really vulnerable. Um, you know, I think there's two things that come to mind. It, it, it's, it seems that you're distracted almost by how, how significant this feeling is. Um, and you know my advice to you of how to do this because you know i felt i felt this way myself at certain times in life is to think about positive affirmations things you know you're good at things that are do make you different and you know what the differences that you perceive are actually necessary and our strengths um and i think that's something that you know when you feel these negative thoughts coming in and and shifting your focus from focusing on your 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 fellowship and your training, um, I think you have to actively, you know, take a breath and think of positive thoughts. I mean, we're gonna talk about a whole bunch of strategies, but I mean, I am I'm just so overwhelmed to hear both of your stories. Any and what else of our panelists who want to comment on that? Any advice that you would give to our doctors in training here who feel this? Well, I, I, just to... Sorry. Um, I guess I'll speak really quickly. Um, Dr. Powers and Dr. Singh, so important for you guys to share that, especially with other trainees that might be um, on this conference right now. Um, it took a lot of strength for you guys to do that. Um, so um, definitely empowerment to you. And as Dr. Sanders mentioned, it really is the structural environment that needs to change. Um, we need to make sure that we are providing a safe workplace for um, the female gender, especially when they're in a field that might um, lack the diversity of the female gender. Um, the one thing I might recommend to you guys, and I think you guys already know it, um, exactly what you were saying, ask them for more constructive feedback, more constructive suggestions. Not about the behavior, but about the action. Um, so, you know, when you are encountering a procedure with a faculty member and you don't feel that they're giving you the technical feedback, ask for it. Don't be afraid to ask for it. Okay. Um, but thank you so much for sharing that. We've all gone through this, and it's so important that other people understand that, acknowledge it, and um, again, change the, the workforce in a sense. And any other comments at this point? If not, we'll move on to the next uh, the next uh, segment of speakers. I just uh, want to make one comment um, in first gratitude, as the other said, for speaking up um, and sharing this because those in training or those of us who are past um, are reflecting back and that what you describe, certainly um, as a resident and fellow, I felt you know that that concept of I think stereotype threat where we are concerned about how we're going to perform and that we're going to be judged and that I'm working with the chair or with this person who previously gave me unclear, difficult feedback. And then what do I do? But I walk in and I underperform partially due to my angst about um, my performance. Um, and, and so that is a real what what other words we use. And I um, I just the affirmation that's been brought up and the um, identifying that, as you said, you know, you've you've all gotten to this point. You've you've you know gotten through and excelled through med school and and intern year and residency and and then you're here in fellowship. And that's what I hope that I amplify when I'm working with residents and fellows that um, to try and overcome that that you know doubt, but also that stereotype threat, if you will. Um, knowing that um, at the same time, we're all continue whatever level we're at to do that. So I look forward to 
um, hearing more from others. And just one more comment on this. Um, I think it's important to highlight, and I think um, both Dr. Singh and Dr. Powers heard the affirmations from other female faculty, but from other colleagues, the importance of having a community. So um, that's part of what Women in Neuromodulation offers trainees and those um, who are out in practice, because um, our voices, our negative voices to ourselves are loudest when they're in our head. Once we say them out loud, especially when we say them out loud to other people who are um, advocates for us, the voice is diminished and it doesn't have as much power. So remember the importance of community. That's a great point. All right, so let's move on to the next section of career and we're going to um, start with Dr. Ashley Scott Bailey Classen. Hey guys, first of all, I wanna thank Wynn for having such an amazing group of panelists on tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ashley Bailey Classen. I'm a private practice physician down in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, part of what I want to talk about that has um, impacted imposter syndrome for me is actually something that I call mistaken identity. I kind of want to start tonight with a question. How many of us have been assumed to be something we are not? How many of us have had to deal with incorrect preconceptions or presumptions of who we are or what we are or what we do. So for those of you who don't know me, I am somewhat vertically challenged. Didn't get very much in the Heights department. So between that, being relatively young in my career, I'm in my first three years out of fellowship. Um, a lot of times there's no, it, I get the concept of, there's no way you could actually be the physician. Uh, I'm sure all of us could recount instances where this has happened to each one of us. I wanna give you kind of three examples that have happened to me over the last few years. Sometimes there are social situations, especially when we're out with industry, people just walking up to you, sticking, your hand, sticking their hand out and going, hey, what's your territory? Automatically assuming you're an industry rep um, and not the physician that is attending the said course. I'll distinctly remember my very first day at a surgery center. Um, I was brand new there. My, my CRNA came bustling in the room, she's running late, and she pretty much told me to get out of the way. She was looking for her surgeon. There was no way I was the surgeon she was working with all day long, but I was. Lastly, and something that happens to me pretty much on a weekly basis is our patients who think, you're way too young, there's no way you have the knowledge base or the experience to be the physician. I don't wanna sit here tonight and rehash experiences that all of us have had I actually wanna to try to equip you with three points that I utilize in my day-to-day -day work life um, to try and prevent this from happening. My first thing, introductions. If I'm introducing really any member of my team, any of my colleagues, I try and actually highlight who they are, what they do, what their role is. If they're a physician, I highlight the fact that they're a physician, where they practice. If I know what their specialty is or what they like to do on a daily basis. I also do this to my support staff, whether it's my MAs in the room with me, whether it's my OR support crew or my rad tech. I truly think we have to build each other up, not build ourselves up on the backs of others. Secondarily is my skills. Every single day I come to work, I try to do a better job each and every time. I strive for absolute, absolute continual improvement. Part of that is I wanna build my reputation. I want a good reputation. I want a good reputation as a good pain doc. I want a good reputation as a good surgeon. Our reputation precedes us. So if we're known as someone who is good, that it becomes well known. Our identity will no longer be mistaken. The converse can also be true, however. The last thing I wanna highlight is something I try to do to actually build my own confidence. I wanna know the literature. I wanna know the most recent studies that are out there. I wanna try, not always, can be, but I wanna to try to be one of the experts in the room. Someone is always gonna know more than you. Someone's always gonna know the literature, but I wanna be up there and be able to kind of bat back and forth with them the same amount of knowledge. These last two points I bring up tonight do require a little bit of elbow grease, but remember to work for what you want. Don't ever be afraid of the challenge, but make sure you arm yourself for the challenge. Um, hopefully these few points may help you to not have a case of mistaken identity. 
And with that, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Hunt. Christy, you're muted. Thank you. Um, I was, so I was going to say, a little known fact, Dr. Bailey Class and I were actually um, uh, in the same exact same medical school class at the University of North Tex Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, uh, I since migrated to Minnesota and then to Florida. But um, Dr. Bailey Class is pretty tough. Um, we, we did play on the same Potter Puff football team, as I recall. And um, she may be short of stature. But that does not in any way diminish her um, her uh, toughness or ability or prowess. So it's a real pleasure to get to um, be on the panel with her. Um, so uh, my name is Christy Hunt. Um, I currently practice down at Mayo Clinic in the Department of Pain Medicine in Jacksonville, Florida, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to this audience. Um, so you know, first of all, I wanted to just um, kind of share when it comes to imposter syndrome, just my general thoughts on it. It is true that we all second guess, and it is true that we all have self-doubt from time to time. And, and for me, where that spectrum kind of lies is really in, when does that rise to the level of it really affecting our performance, our confidence, our function? Um, you know, maybe for you, it's completely, you know, no one could ever tell, but you're having a hard time sleeping at night. Or maybe you're having anxiety going into your day, or maybe you're constantly questioning or second guessing decisions that you make. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's, you know, you kind of wonder, well, what really is imposter syndrome and how do I know if it's just kind of second guessing and things that are more, more mild or normal. But what I would say is at the end of the day, it really comes down to how it's affecting your quality of life, your function, your practice, um, your training, wherever it is that you might be um, in your career. Um, so I remember when I graduated, looking forward to fellowship graduation, when I started fellowship, let's say, I expected by the end of the year and the transition to career, I expected to feel liberated, ready, confident. And there's really no magic button that gets pushed and you kind of like, you know, go in and out of the phone booth and all of a sudden you are um, imbued with um, complete confidence and um, you, you shed any self-doubt. Of course, it doesn't happen. Um, and uh, there, there's, there's really nothing magical about the transition other than, you know, um, uh, you've now made the transition to full career. So um, that sense of imposter syndrome can sometimes become even worse um, when you transition from training to full staff because you think to yourself, wait a minute, there's still so much that I'm learning. There's still so much that I feel like I haven't truly mastered. Um, uh, perhaps finer technique of some surgical skills, perhaps, you know, really finessing those less bed and butter procedures. And in fact, it's really the whole career arc where we develop some of those skill sets. Um, so that's where it can really actually come out quite prominently is in kind of that first early career path. Um, so I wanted to share three anecdotes um, with this group. Um, uh, um, one is that whenever it came to where I first started my career, I was working at the same place where I had been a trainee. Um, I was privileged to have Dr. Milcher as my program director and I can personally attest um, that you did help us combat stereotype threat and all of these negative feelings on a daily basis. I was very fortunate to have you as my program director, helped fill me with a lot of confidence. But I still had that feeling as I worked with um, the, the same team that had known me as a trainee, you know, are they really seeing me, um, you know, as, as staff, right? Am I always going to kind of feel like a trainee to them? You know, when I thought about um, the, you know, giants in our field, when I thought about um, the staff that I worked with and their stature, their knowledge, their expertise, you know, how can I possibly ever hope to kind of reach their level? Um, and uh, so there was kind of that sense of, um, you know, I wonder how people are seeing me, right? How am I being perceived? Uh, you know, do, do people think I'm doing a good job? Do people think I'm competent? Um, those sorts of things can be hard to tell. Um, so that's that's uh, certainly one thing that um, you can go through as you make that transition. Um, uh, I know I've also noted that without being um, specific, you know, generally speaking, I've been extended some incredible, incredible opportunities in early career that I'm unbelievably thankful for. And sometimes I wonder, you know, gosh, do I really deserve these? Have I really earned these things? Is there something that people don't, you know, do people really, you know, know who I am? Am I really capable of doing these? Am I competent enough? Am I really the right person um, for some of these great opportunities and great chances? 
Um, those are also common feelings um, and uh, I, uh, certainly affect me and I think affect many of us. Um, and then the last is a really specific anecdote um, that I think hopefully some of you might get a chuckle out of. Um, I was consenting the patient for a procedure. Um, it was myself and this very nice patient and um, uh, the nurse I was working with that day. And so I was going through the consent process and everything. And you know, we have masks on because of COVID. And so it's a little hard to read facial expressions, but he, he looked a little puzzled. And so we got through the consent. It was for occipital nerve block, I think, something like that. And um, he said, you know, do you have any questions? And he kind of looked at me with that puzzled look. And I said, you know, um, you know, what questions do you have? And he said, you're young. I kind of looked and paused, not sure what to say. Looked at my nurse and said, and you're a woman. Like he was not being mean or rude or nasty. He was just totally shocked at both of those facts. Um, and and um, I, kinda, I kind of said, I don't remember exactly what my response was. I was kind of totally taken aback. And he said, well, you know, I, I think I can take really great care of you today, sir. And if you're ready to proceed, we can move forward with this. And, you know, by the end of the procedure, um, you know, I think he felt, um, you know, reasonably confident and he got good care. And um, he later apologized kind of for that comment. Um, but at the end of the day, I looked at my nurse and I said, did I, did I hear what I thought I heard? And she said, yes, you did. Um, you know, and um, that's tough. You know, it's tough to hear that in front of a colleague. It's tough to hear that from a patient. Um, uh, and we all, we all um, encounter scenarios like that all the time. And um, uh, so sort of learning how to navigate some of those things and how do I make sure that those, I'm not really, these, these, these thoughts um, that um, probably many of us have, you know, am I good enough? Am I competent enough? What do my colleagues around me think about me? What do my patients think about me? Um, you know, how can we possibly deal with some of these um, feelings in these situations? And when we're talking about imposter syndrome, I don't want to conflate this with actual um, uh, um, discrimination, right? And all of its different forms based on any number of um, characteristics or identities. Um, you know, I am not suggesting some strategies to help combat a genuinely hostile work environment. So that is, so please don't hear me say if you just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, you can combat, um, like I said, a truly hostile or toxic environment. Um, but for the kind of um, imposter syndrome, we're really kind of struggling with those feelings of, um, am I good enough? Um, have I earned this, et cetera? Um, I would say it really all comes down to, in addition to the great advice that others have given, what I would offer is it comes down to how do you fix your mirror, right? There's something about when you're looking at yourself in the mirror, um, you know, it's, it's cracked or it's dirty and you're, and you're just not really quite seeing the right or the accurate um, uh, reflection. And it's not about looking good or not looking good, you know, or like, like I said, look, looking competent or not looking competent. It's about really seeing who you are. And where are the areas that you need to continue to grow and be better and learn more and refine, refine your skill set? Um, and where are those areas that it's really kind of more addressing the self-doubt? So it's really seeing a true mirror and a true reflection. Um, so three ways that we might do that. Number one, don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Don't just keep pushing forward and think this is going to get better. This is going to be fine. I just need to be tougher. I just need to move forward more. I'll feel better in a year. I'll feel better in two years or three years. Um, tincture of time isn't always the uh, cure. Um, and so I would say really don't try to ignore these feelings or suppress these feelings, especially if they're interfering with your mood, your sleep, your interactions with your friends. If it's, it's really starting to, or your, or your colleagues, your family, it's really starting to affect some of those things. Um, definitely don't ignore it. Um, number two, mentorship. Um, Dr. Moshler was one of several people who told me early and often how important mentorship was and having a bench of mentors. You need to make sure that you have um, uh, at least one mentor. It doesn't even have to necessarily be somebody in medicine, somebody who you can trust, somebody who knows you, um, that you can go to and just be honest about some of these feelings of self-doubt. You know, hey, how did you deal with this? What advice would you have? Um, uh, like when one of the earlier fellows was talking about the relationship with Dr. Um, uh, Pori and how much that helped. So mentorship is critical for helping you get that more accurate reflection. Um, and then finally, I would say, um, and this is a little bit of a strange one, um, I would say shift your focus, not to, you know, am I competent enough? Am I good enough? Those are, that's all great advice. But another thing that I would focus on is what are your intrinsic values? Step away from the feelings you might have regarding your competency or confidence and take a step back and say, what are my intrinsic values? What are the things that are inherently important to me? Is it 
honesty? Is it um, treating people with kindness, respect? Whatever those intrinsic values are to you, and they're completely um, independent of external factors, um, uh, there are those inherent values that are very important to you. Um, think about how you can uphold those in your day-to-day -day life. And, not, and there might be things that you can't control. You might, you might not be able to control if a procedure doesn't go well or if there's a difficult patient interaction or if um, you know, a presentation that you were working on didn't go as you wanted it to, if you didn't get a grant that you'd applied for, right? Those are things not within our complete control. But if you can really sit down, like write down what those intrinsic values are and think of specific examples of how you can uphold those in your daily life, maybe it might help guide you toward the type of practice that you want, the career that you want, maybe a direction that you can go in your career. And if you can make sure that you're upholding those in your daily life and finding those ways that you can really connect with your work um, and find joy in your practice um, and better aligning your path with those, you might find that it really helps with some of these feelings of imposter syndrome because you can really be focused on these intrinsic values that you know are inherently good no matter what. And it can sometimes help us refocus away from uh, some of the kind of imposter phenomenon feelings. Um, so thank you for letting me share my thoughts. Um, and uh, thank everybody for being here too and taking your time to be here this evening. We could have all the panelists uh, back on the screen. That'd be great. Dr. Bailey Klassen, Dr. Hunt, thank you so much for sharing those um, experiences about early career. And I was having flashbacks to my own start of my career. Um, I think all of us on this call can certainly remember those feelings of like, is everyone watching? Am I doing this right? Am I, I think I'm doing this right. I know I'm doing this right. Am I doing this right? You know, these kind of questions coming up in your mind. So I have to say, you know, Dr. Poré is one of my mentors in my entire career. And I, I have to ask you, Dr. Poré, what, what is your advice? I mean, you've helped me so much. What is your advice in crossing that threshold for those first few cases? You know, we're all neuromodulators here. What, what's your advice? to you know crossing that threshold of feeling being in your own competency feeling you know your own skill set wow um i remember my first epidural as a uh out of fellowship took me about an hour and i said well i'm not going to get too far with this but um uh, something that dr hunt uh mentioned that really uh uh struck a nerve there was identifying your value system and I think that's for me that's always been my guiding light is to identify my own value system so I heard stories about people thinking they were too young and they're women and whatnot but you know I, I've been mistaken for the janitor half the time and and uh, you know the garbage man and whatever else and I've been accused of being escaped convict at least four times uh, and so being a black American male you know it's I was born into this environment and so I guess it's my mother's uh, confidence in me from the early time I can remember is not to really care about what other people say and think. And it's never been something I've struggled with in that respect. I've always figured it's always there and it's not something I'm gonna deal with. With the same token though, there are some value systems and it's something I try to instill in the fellows. I have a set of rules that Christian knows well. Um, and one of those rules is to treat everybody like your mother. And uh, I say that for a variety of reasons. One, because many times the fellows would give me a, a plan or a resume, give me a plan that I'd say, well, is that really how you treat your mother? I said, no, but it's, you know, I think I get out of the book. And I said, no, you know, give me an answer for your mother because hopefully you care about your mother and, and uh, hopefully you want her to be a person that's getting the best of care. And as long as you're doing that, it could be wrong. How oh, my mother came to me and, and I see her as a patient on occasion, and she was telling me about all sorts of problems, and I thought it was all spine related. She's had multiple spine surgeries, so I thought that's what it was, and completely missed a boat that she had a thyroid, a parathyroid problem. And uh, somebody else picked it up, and I said, oh, that's fantastic. But um, when I looked back at the mentors that I have, um, it's people who I believe will give me real evaluation, uh, after fellowship, I uh, worked for you know for the last 20 years or plus with my my wife, who is more than happy. She's also a pain doc. More than happy to make sure that you know she gives me adequate feedback, and I trust that feedback. And she said, you know, you didn't do the right thing here, or you know, you didn't approach that patient the right way. And I take that seriously, just like if I take my mom's uh, 
uh, evaluation of me seriously, but uh, if you focus in on what you're trying to accomplish with your value system, the external stuff is always going to be there. Um, you know, I learned that the, before I can remember that that wasn't something I was going to pay attention to because if I did, I wasn't going to get anywhere. Uh, I had many people say I shouldn't go to college. I, you know, you name it. You know, I shouldn't have a PhD. Shouldn't have an MD. Shouldn't have a master's. Shouldn't be working. I mean. Hell, you when I got to my most recent job, the department chair of neurosurgery called me up after 48 hours and complained that I was there and I shouldn't be at the university. I shouldn't be doing neuromodulation. I was interfering with his plans. You know, I just, you know, these are people who are out there and there's lots of these people out there and you can't really, in my own mind, I growing up with this. So it was something that I just shrugged off and I told the department chair, my own department chair that Man, this guy's an idiot and you guys ought to deal with that, but I'm not gonna interact with him any longer. Uh, but finding those people to interact with is so critically important. It's people you can really trust, people you know who have the same value system as you, you know, care about your mother. And I can tell you that it was a WIN member uh, before we even had WIN, but one of my main mentors um, and one of the people I would call on a regular basis to ask her opinion, and you all know her, um, uh, Lisa Stearns, unfortunately lost her a couple years ago. Um, when I saw her and saw her present and talk about her patients, simultaneously, my wife and I looked at one another and said, that's the kind of doctor we want to be. That's the kind of practice we want to have. That is the, the pinnacle of what we need to be doing. And if we get half there, halfway there, then we'd be doing a great job at our patients. And so when I struggled with extremely difficult cancer patients, uh, she would be the one I call. And uh, it was always there, always available to help me give me advice and to uh, sort of give me suggestions on what to do next. And you need those people, you need people you can trust and uh, the rest of it, there's always gonna be those people. And you know, it's, for me, it's like, that's just part of the environment I'm in. Uh, just like, you know, when it snows outside, I get cold, um, even though it doesn't snow here. And so, um, you don't really, um, I guess from my early age, my mom says, you know, you can't pay attention to any of that. And so I, I haven't. And, you know, uh, as a result, I focus in on the values that I've gotten from my family, my wife, and those mentors that I highly respect and concentrate on that and let the rest of it go by its side. But that's my opinion. I, I think that's, a, those are excellent, excellent points. And, you know, for many of us, you know, the field of neuromodulation, sometimes we get into new hospitals or centers and we're the first only different, right? They've, some of these hospitals in certain areas have never, still never, you know, seen a deer G implant, you know, and they're like, they're looking at you like, what are you doing? Um, and so I think, you know, Regardless of your background, I think we can all uh, relate to that. Any of for any of our other uh, panelists, any other times that you could remember where you felt you were a first only different um, early on in your career, um, you know, either doing your first cases for surgeries, um, starting in a new practice. Um, I have to say that I'm the I'm the first female physician they've had in my department or our spine center or um, and the other department that's right next door to us. And I got a lot of comments, generally positive ones when I started, um, you know, um, but to a degree, I, I sometimes felt like, well, gosh, this is, this is great that, that people are happy about this, but, you know, do people kind of, you know, see me in, in somewhat of like a, kind of a single dimension? And definitely when it came down to um, some of the staff that we worked with, particularly in the OR, um, you know, there was, you know, there was that sense of, you know, number one, I'm brand new. Number two, I'm the youngest by several years um, from the next youngest faculty and I'm the first female they've had. So um, there was definitely, um, you know, um, truly due to nobody making me feel any certain way, um, you know, which is really kind of the definition of imposter syndrome. But, you know, this kind of sense of, you know, are people sort of, you know, wondering about my competence? Are they kind of, you know, looking at me with, um, you know, kind of, you know, kind of watching for what I'm doing and, um, uh, you know, but again, I, th I think that was a lot of kind of internalized um, sensation, but um, uh, that I've definitely felt um, first only in different, um, uh, in, in quite a few scenarios. And I know a lot of people have had similar experiences. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I, 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 really nicely into my topic. 
Awesome. Next, if we could move to the next slide. Please introduce yourself and we'll yes. all get off meet our cameras. Rosenberg, Mazur, and I did my residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Mayo Rochester, and I continued on to a fellowship in pain medicine there, and I was fortunate to be trained by two of the panelists, at least on this call. Um, Dr. Brian Holzer was my director, and Dr. Susan Moshler was one of my female mentors at the time there, and so I really went through a program where I felt really supported, and one point I wanted to make is that imposter syndrome can happen even in the ideal circumstances. So even if your situation isn't fostering a sense of imposter syndrome, you can still feel that way. And so I wanna make sure that people who um, are part of a practice or a program know that it's not necessarily because of something that you're doing, but the goal of this talk is to recognize where we might be able to help um, and minimize some of the risk factors or contributing factors. So since my graduation, I've been a part of three practices. And the first, I was employed by the physical medicine and rehabilitation department, but I was working in the anesthesia pain department. The second, I was employed by the orthopedic surgery department, but I was working in the pain department. And this current practice that I've just joined, I'm working um, and employed by the anesthesia pain department. And in each structure, I definitely embodied that first only different um, Chandra Rhymes quote that Dr. Patel talked about. Um, in this case, I am the first non-anesthesia provider in the pain practice. So in many ways, that's a pro. I bring something to the practice that hasn't been there before, and we have a fellowship program, so I bring a perspective that hasn't been embodied in the staff before, and that's fantastic. In other ways, it can sometimes feel isolating, and I think what we should, um, what I can bring to the group is just areas that you might recognize might be a factor in your own program or practice that you can look out for um, to avoid exacerbating imposter syndrome or look for ways that um, that folks might feel isolated. So some concrete examples that I've noticed in my jobs in the past um, have been things like the credentialing process. So I have received orthopedic surgery credentials and had to cross off 75 or more percent. I've received anesthesiology credentials and had to cross off a bunch. And that just fostered a sense of, do I really belong here? Am I gonna be able to do this job? Am I gonna fit in? Um, and of course that had nothing to do with the people I was working with or the job I was doing. It was just a stock set of forms that, that came from the department. Um, and none of these things in isolation is necessarily that important, but they can kind of build up and contribute or exacerbate a sense of, um, of otherness or unease that you already have. Um, some other areas are participating in grand rounds when you have time off to go to grand rounds, but the topics do not in any way um, pertain to what you what your training is. Like, I don't really need to know about other perioperative um, anesthesia topics. And interestingly, that doesn't apply to most of my 100% pain anesthesia colleagues either. Uh, but for me, sometimes it feels a little bit different, like I'm skipping out um, and feel a little excluded or like I'm not doing my share of, um, of the work. Um, other areas are in salary or work hours when my boss has nothing to do with my actual day-to-day -day job and so it's hard to talk about those things or you feel a sense of um, discrepancy despite doing the same amount of work. Um, and also in caseload distribu distribution where a lot of a particular type of case comes to me because of my background even though uh, my skill set is not necessarily different than my colleagues. And funnily enough, just to make things complicated, sometimes it's um, it's actually in a positive way that people are singling um, the other person out. So um, you can be singled out as an expert in an area where maybe you don't feel like an expert or that's not where you wanna focus your practice. Um, or sometimes um, you can make, be made to feel a little bit like the token member of the team and wonder if you were added just because they were looking for somebody a little bit different. So for example, in fellowship interviews, um, you know, you want to include uh, someone who may relate to some of the applicants, um, but you sometimes that's interpreted as being included just because of the background and not because of other values. And again, none of these things is necessarily bad in isolation, but I think the point that I would like to make is if you are feeling this way, um, it's just important to recognize the difference and and bring it out into the light. 
So that can be through actually discussing that with your colleagues. I've found that a lot of the times, you know, some of these um, feelings of otherness, they recognize and, um, and as soon as I talk about them, there have been solutions. Um, for example, Grand Rounds hooking up with the physical medicine and rehab Grand Rounds, or just hearing that some of my other colleagues don't feel like the topics pertain to them either. So it's actually a shared experience. Um, or talking to colleagues and mentors, or even getting an outside opinion like a career coach to just help you work through some of the feelings that you have that may not necessarily be related to a problem, but something that you perceive. And then if you are part of a program or a practice, just to recognize where the members of your group might feel different and might feel a sense of otherness or isolation and trying to intervene as appropriate, either just talking about them or finding ways to include folks who may have um, a different background or a different skill set. Um, and so those would be my recommendations just to, to try not to exacerbate any sense of imposter syndrome um, and make everyone feel included as possible. And with that, I will pass it on to my colleague, Dalia Mofti. Thank you so much, Cassandra. Um, if we can go to the next slide. All right. So today I'm going to be talking about constructive suggestions perceived as complaints. Okay. Next slide, please. So what is the real definition of a complaint? Well, according to Robin Kowalski, which is who was a professor in behavioral psychology, she basically stated that it's pretty difficult to define a complaint because they tend to overlap with a number of other similar speech acts, such as criticism. But she defined it as an expression of personal dissatisfaction resulting from a disconfirmation of expectancies. Now, there's two types of complaints. There's a direct complaint and indirect complaint. A direct complaint is basically sorry about that, is basically made against the talk's current recipient. It's a face-threatening act. Um, they may have negative repercussions, and it's negative repercussions for the speaker and the hearer. An example of that is a husband and wife, you know, arguing over chores or complaining over chores. A majority of our complaints are actually indirect complaints. Um, they are expressions or dissatisfactions about oneself, someone or something not present. It's not a face-threatening act, and it may actually have positive repercussions, such as building solidarity. Next slide, please. What is a constructive suggestion? Well, it's a feedback given to help identify solutions to issues or concerns. It comes with positive intentions by identifying the issue, stating your concerns, and providing a potential solution. So surprisingly, there was constructive suggestions that I had provided to our administrative staffs regarding concerns in the clinic, and unfortunately, it was perceived as a complaint. I'll give you some examples of some of the um, constructive suggestions that I made. One of them was, for example, I mentioned that I wanted to bring your attention that there have been an increasing number of patients presenting for procedures in the clinic without a driver to return home. This is a patient safety issue. And could we please confirm transportation prior to bringing the patient back to the pain clinic? Another constructive suggestion that I made was, for example, here, I wanted to bring to your attention that lately I've noticed an increasing number of medication refills without appropriate follow-ups. Again, this is a patient safety concern. And can we please designate a standard return policy for medication refills? Now, as I spoke up about my concerns that I had, I was actually judged as being too aggressive. Next slide, please. So why were my concerns perceived in a negative context? What was I doing wrong? You know, the goal, again, was to provide constructive suggestions in an attempt to prevent what currently was a minor problem from becoming a potential disaster. Well, as I thought about it, I realized I did not know how to navigate the unwritten rules in our workplace. You're probably wondering, what are these unwritten rules? Well, we need to remember that the workforce was designed and managed by men. Management structures and rules were established decades ago prior by men. We as women walked into this environment expecting to play by the rules and that hard work would be rewarded. Um, but that's not always the case. One of the things that I did learn from this 
quote unquote complaint or being perceived as a complainer is that I should actually never use the word I in my constructive suggestions and instead use the word our team or we. Because even in this day and age, unfortunately, there's still a natural opposition to a woman's suggestion. Next slide, please. So this incident really made me kind of doubt myself and doubt my judgment. Just as I was starting to reach a phase in my career where I finally was developing confidence in my abilities, you know, I just kept wondering what is it, you know, what happened when I spoke up? Why was I considered being forceful and bossy? Should I have just been silent? Well, the unfortunate truth is that when women do speak up in professional settings, we are either barely heard or we're judged as being too aggressive. And when men say virtually the same thing, um, you know, nods are, you know, they're encouraged. Um, you know, what they're saying is um, encouraged and I guess sometimes considered more appreciated than um, when a female says it. And there seems to be this stereotype that suggests that there's something wrong with being strong and a confident woman. And yes, as female gender, we are brought up to be nice girls. You know, we grow up being encouraged to be cordial and pleasing. And boys are always told to stand out and they're praised when they are competitive and outspoken. You know, women, as women, we're expected to fit in and not challenge others. And if we disagree with someone, we should stay silent because we don't want to make someone else look or feel bad. But unfortunately, when we go along with these stereotypes, we reinforce the expectations others have of us. It reinforces the impression that women should be soft-spoken and weaker than men. And when we defy these stereotypes, we encounter those harsh labels as aggressive and bossy. So how do we break the spell? Well, one of the most important things is not worry about being labeled aggressive or bossy because eventually our actions are gonna speak louder than the words, okay? And we also shouldn't lash back. We shouldn't be emotional, we shouldn't be anger, but we should be rational. And we need to confidently affirm our right to present our ideas by being factual and straight to the point. And even more important, we need to teach our future generation of leaders, you know, as a parent, um, you know, we can change these stereotypes by bringing up our daughters to be confident and teaching our sons to believe that women can be strong and confident and that one, men can also show a softer side. Next slide, please. So there is this perceived stereotype that women complain more than men. And the research shows that gender is likely to confound the possibility that a suggestion or a quote unquote complaint, which is intended to improve the situation will actually be perceived negatively, especially if it comes from the female gender. According to Wolf and colleagues, men and women have different discourse styles. And it seems that when or seems that what, one, what women may view as confiding and commiserating, men may view as whining or even incompetent. Analyzing the difference in which men and women complain may help us understand why women are perceived negatively as complainers. And there is a study that these um, authors conducted in which they had three different groups which co basically consisted of males and females and they worked together on a team project for technical writing skills. They analyzed the conversational interactions by gender of speaker. And basically the authors found that women have more collaborative conversational styles while men are more confrontational and competitive. They also found that women are more likely than men to use complaints as a way to call others into account or um, indirectly request some of the remedial actions while men use complaints more like more to excuse behavior and actions. Next slide, please. So as Dr. Sanders had mentioned earlier, you know, in order to recognize females in the workplace, we need to acknowledge the obstacles that female genders have to climb over and that are consistently in our way. Um, it's a structural environmental issue. A lot of literature published on imposter syndrome focuses on individual fixes. But again, um, like what this article had mentioned is it's not really the individual fix that we need to approach, but it's more the leadership and administration to help them or ask them to play more of an active role in addressing the environment that is likely the root source. Um, similar to addressing burnout, right? Um, for addressing the frustration um, that physicians feel from burnout. 
You know, the state, these authors stated that imposter syndrome is a symptom, but inequity is the real disease. And the data does suggest that women tend to frame their suggestions as questions in order to obtain approval and agreement from their peers, as I did when I addressed my concern. And of course, it was to avoid seeming abrasive. Some other studies show that women are penalized for exercising power and valuability in meetings. But when men do it, again, it's a strong positive effect for them. This leads women to doubt their capabilities and deepen our sense of imposter syndrome. And we need a work environment that provides a safe platform for us to express our ideas and concerns without feeling paralyzed. Dr. Um, Dr. Omofti, I'm so sorry to interrupt. We have about 14 minutes left and we have two more presentations. So we're gonna get to those. Right. We're gonna well ask some questions. Wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. We're gonna move right on to our last two uh, presenters. Dr. Alan Ayer and Dr. Susie Moshler, if you could join us. All right, uh, so I am Ellen Ayer. I am a I'm the residency uh, director for neurosurgery at Henry Ford in Detroit. Um, I would have said, that I could have easily earned a PhD in uh, having the imposter syndrome over the years and the various ways that I have experienced it. And rather than give you a, uh, a version play by play of the various scenarios that I lived that out, what I will say is I have, hopefully, I think that I have been trying to, as a residency director, um share that in some way be a little bit more vulnerable about that and being almost meta about having that conversation with our residents to help them in their own development so one of the things that has been a very clear theme here is the issue of how it is that we give feedback and that sometimes the feedback is not always a um it doesn't feel like it is objective and that is something we've worked on very strongly in our program to uh, try to hone the ways in which we give feedback to our residents to be much more specific and actionable so that they can take it and move forward and that there is not a sense of, oh, your personality or your, you know, there's just not something we, we like. You just don't seem confident enough um, sort of approach to it. But like I said, I think one of the key things that I have tried to um, be much more open about has been my experience. You know, in neurosurgery, overall nationally, we're still less than 15% of the residents are female. So it's still a very male dominated specialty. And so most of my residents are men. And what I have noticed is that my, and, and frankly, there's a little bit of this in our department that even our chair is somebody who will step back and say, gosh, I don't know if I really did the right thing there. I'm questioning myself that weaves this open to discussion. But the fact that I will say, you know, I questioned X, Y, or Z yesterday um, and throughout the uh, various stages of my training, I feel like I have seen quite a lot of latent imposter syndrome, if you'd call it, in, in even our male residents, that they have not had the opportunity to share and to um, express and figure out how they manage their sense of whether they truly live up to their, um, what they believe their expectations are and whether they truly deserve to be there. So I think that actually the fact that we're having this conversation is critically important because it's something that we should be having on a semi-regular basis to say, we all question our decisions at times. We all question whether it's something we should have done better or known better. And that is normal and natural. And if we don't have that conversation, we might end up um, hurting ourselves. So um, that's what I would say is, is 
the, um, the thing that I have taken away from my personal experiences and tried to translate into being a program director. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ayer. I'm gonna jump right in. I've had the pleasure to work with Dr. Ayer um, uh, as for the pro annual program. Um, so I'm just pleased to be on this panel with you. Um, I wanna share. I wanted to say uh, one thing. Oh, we are getting yeah. tight on time, but we are gonna extend it over. So feel free to you know say your whole thing. And then for those of you that are our viewers, feel free to stay on because we're, you know, we are gonna go over a few minutes. And if you'd like to stay on with us, please do. Um, as a program director and as faculty, I feel like it is our responsibility, and it is as per ACGME, to create a safe learning environment. Um, and that is such that um, a trainee feels supported to ask questions, to, to not be perfect because none of us are. Um, and I think my role as a program director and faculty are you know, to give positive um, support and affirmation to trainees, not just as a medical trainee, but as a person, um, and recognizing that we are all, um, we all make mistakes, we all, you know, hit our snooze, we all, um, you know, don't, don't have um, the A game every day, and that is okay and expected, um, but, but working hard and, and allowing for that learning, um, at the same time of recognizing that also treating trainees with respect is giving direct and honest feedback and saying good job and then turning around and saying otherwise um, and keeping it as a content or milestone competency based is so important. Um, it's not the person I'm, you know, we're not as colleagues always going out with each other to, you know, have coffee, but, um, you know, you have to be collegial and professional. And so setting that sort of safe environment for my trainees as well as um, faculty. I also think um, there was an earlier story in the beginning about where a colleague, they were in the OR together and um, a male colleague was being given more time for, you know, a, a procedure. And I think as faculty, you know, setting the stage such that each trainee is set up for success, recognizing you know, um, years and splitting things. And that is something I've been more and more, I think, with my experience aware of um, and felt that from my own um, training and where I felt um, like I was being compared even when I wasn't. Um, and so those things are important. And I know we're running out of time. The other thing I would want to just, um, two things, assume good intent. And that can be really difficult. But even when things are said or questioned, um, I can overread comments that are made um, and trying to pause and clarify um, can be very, very helpful. Um, at the same time, asking clarifying questions um, to better understand what the person uh, said or meant is important. And then the other thing I just wanna echo is having a mentor and a panel of mentors and those people who align with your um, values um, for me, you know, integrity, respect, um, and and truth. And Dr. Holzer was my program director, and you know, he would he would give it to me direct. Things I, you know, was doing excellent, and things that I needed to work on, and that was part of training. Um, but build your bench of mentors beyond just your specialty. Um, some of my mentors are outside of anesthesia, outside of pain medicine, outside of my institution, and that's very difficult because things change um, and there's great value in having more than one person to go to. So thank you for having me and I look forward to the discussion. Awesome, with all that, I'm gonna ask all of our panelists to come back on and, and uh, you know turn on their cameras. Awesome. I see you there, Dr. Gore. So I'm going to I'm going to ask you a question. So, you know, um, we heard from um, Dr. Mysore and Dr. Amafti about, you know, academia and kind of kind of ascending the ranks there and kind of the changes and then the different scenarios that you encounter as you are advancing your academic career. Um, could you share with us, you know, any experiences that you may have witnessed or experienced, you know, in, as you've moved through your academic career? 
Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, I, I'd be remiss. I'm, I'm rarely someone who's speechless, for those of you who know me, but I am just completely blown away by the bravery of everyone that, that spoke tonight um, and their, you know, emotional connection to imposter syndrome, their willingness to tell their stories. Um, it was absolutely amazing. Um, honored to even be on a panel with all of you and um, the unique perspective that you all bring tonight is is needed and I think it strengthens all of us. Um, getting back to that question, you know, I, I, I want to also acknowledge my, you know, I'll use the word ignorance to, to you know, that experience. You know, I've, I've had some of, some of the imposter syndrome experience as a minority, but obviously I'm ignorant to what it's like to be a woman in academic medicine. But I, I, what I've seen in academic departments is it's great that people are willing to sponsor. And I think great people do sponsor those who don't look like them. Um, and I think it's even better when people encourage people who don't look like them. But I think that, you know, the, the true champions in my department and, and other departments I've seen really work to change culture. Um, and, and one of the things that Dr. Almofti said, you know, talking about all of the things that women and minorities do to make other people comfortable, um, because women and minorities basically live in a world where they are often uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, the true champions that I've seen in academic departments are willing to give up some of their privilege to be uncomfortable also. Um, you know, I think of it like exercise, you know, we get better when we're uncomfortable. Um, and when we are in those rooms and you see that a woman is having to say we so that she can be heard or a man is taking their statement and re rearranging the words and getting the credit for it, um, calling out those stereotypes, those microaggressions um, and making the room uncomfortable um is where that real change happens and i think it's when culture change happens and so i don't know if i answered your question but i think that um the the challenge in academics is that a, a lot of us on this call are often uncomfortable but i think that if everyone gets uncomfortable we're all going to get better and we're going to end up pushing the field forward i think that's an excellent point dr gore you know i think it's it's uncomfortable to be the dissent, dissenting opinion in a room of people, um, especially if you feel you are different fundamentally um, in any other way. Um, I think those two combined together can often have a compounded effect. So Dr. Hunter, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm gonna actually pose a question to you that was um, put into the chat, if you will. Um, and the question is, how do you combat allowing your struggles or failures um, from causing you, changing your opinion of yourself and causing you to feel like an imposter? Um, well, I mean, I, first I would say, I mean, like whatever, um, like the struggles or things that I've had are certainly different than, um, you know, the, the other panelists here. Um, you know, the things that I've had are not inherent to, um, you know, the color of my skin or my gender. Um, just those are, you know, I guess the things that I've encountered were just kind of um, like my expectations on myself. So early on, you know, when I, um, you know, when I was in fellowship, I was a, um, you know, I was the first non-anesthesiologist they took there. So there was, um, you know, when I came in day one, I was kind of seen as um, the one, the the fellow that was going to kill somebody because I didn't know how to manage an epidural, uh, you know, PCA, or I was the one that when they were, had their hands over me, I was doing a procedure, they were like ready to grab it because they thought I was going to, you know, I had never done an epidural in fellowship. For me, um, you know, there was a, I guess it was a turning point where I was like, you know, whatever i'm gonna i'm gonna succeed in this because i'm gonna succeed in this so i didn't let the other expectations um you know of who i was and it just it pushed me that much more i guess not to be snarky or not to kind of push back on them but just it made me you know study that much harder so my experience was you know like i said certainly different than what i think other panels have had to endure um you know given the field so i would say that it's just for me it was more of just the more um, resistance i felt the more i wanted to i guess prove people wrong yeah, that makes sense. I think we can all relate to that. You know, it's it, it's this concept that everyone feels like they're the only one who is different, and it's very alienating and ostracizing. But I think, you know, listening to a lot of the stories um, shared tonight, we can see a very common thread that, you know, in different ways, in different scenarios, many of us have felt 
different, but in a very similar way, um, regardless of you know gender or background. Um, Dr. Holzer, I'm going to ask you another question from the chat. Um, you know, Dr. Al Mafti talked about some ways of different types of communication styles. Um, you know, what's your advice for for individuals who may feel that they have the dissenting of vo voice and that they're not getting their point across effectively? Well, that's a really that's a tough one. Uh, I think everyone on this on this panel or on this call listening has experienced that. I have to say I've been hesitant to even really share my opinion because I'm acutely aware that the last thing the world needs is another straight white male to share his opinion because most of the things we're talking about, frankly, are caused by the fact that we've set the system up to favor straight white males. So I'm a little hesitant to share my opinions because the reason why a female colleague doesn't feel heard in a meeting when they have a dissenting opinion is because we've decided to filter things a certain way and who's important and it's ridiculous to be honest. So bravo to all of you that are on this call because the only way that's going to change is because you are leading, leading out and doing it. It's not going to be it's not going to be me because we have failed uh, long ago as a gender at, at getting this changed. With that being said, I think the the key to that communication is persistence. And sometimes you might be in a meeting and not be heard and you'll have to be persistent in going back to the participants of those meetings and saying, "You know what? When we were there discussing this challenge or problem or future endeavor as a group, I had a thought and an idea that wasn't really communicated or wasn't heard in the meeting. And you have to maybe find advocates that where you talk to them on an individual basis. But the main thing is to not stop. And so I think you've got to continue to express that idea and that opinion um, to all of the people that you can get to listen to you, whether it's in that meeting or following up with it afterwards. But it's not an easy thing for sure. That's great. I always I asked you that because you you often have the dissenting opinion. So I thought you might feel comfortable answering that question there, um, Dr. Provenzano. There was another interesting question um, in in the chat saying that how what is what is the general advice of how how to you know you could be going through your day feeling like everything's going great and you know um, presumably a woman in the chat said this that you're mistaken as a rep. How do you how do you not let that put you off balance? Um, I know your wife is a physician, and we've talked about this in the past. Maybe you can shed some light onto you know those discussions that you've had uh, with your wife, who's in the medical field. Yeah, no, thank you. This is a great session, and I appreciate you for asking me involved. I have to agree with Brian. I mean, I think that for me to speak, I, I think more of this is a more session for me to listen. But I will tell you that my wife's a physician, and hearing some of the struggles that she's dealt with are very similar to the struggles that the other individuals on this uh, or Zoom have demonstrated. I think if someone says that to you, I would just confront them. I mean, just like, I would confront that individual saying, I'm not a rep, I'm a physician, and I expect to be treated by like a physician. I can remember my orthopedic advisor at the University of Rochester was a female. And I remember I sat in her room with her and she was my advisor and she was like super kind, always helpful and then we left the office and she was totally a different individual and she and I, I said to her I, i'm not going to say her name but i said why does that happen she goes look at the world i live in it's not as friendly as my office and i think um if people do not address you the way that you should be addressed i would confront them i would just demand that respect and and that's personally what i would do in any aspect of life so if you're a physician you're getting treated like a rep i just wouldn't tolerate it that's that's really refreshing to hear that um, that stand standpoint from you coming from you you know on because um, I think a lot of us are often afraid to to be seen as too demanding and to be um, too vociferous if you will um, so that's that's really reassuring to hear that from you Dr. Provenzano um, last but not least Dr. Rosenau I wanted to I you know you've trained so many physicians and. I, I am a big believer that a way for us to deal with imposter syndrome is to embrace our differences and, and look at them as strengths. Um, you know, what what is your general advice in terms of how diversity um, has enhanced the physicians who you've trained, like their ability to 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 acknowledge that they're different and to engage with patients? in a different way. What impact you've seen on patient care for those who embrace them being different? I think you're muted. 
Not anymore. Um, so I want to reiterate what other people said uh, earlier about uh, how wonderful it is to be on this and how I think it's great that we're bringing this issue to the forefront uh, and really allowing this to get aired out so people can understand that they're not alone when dealing with these sorts of feelings and problems. Um, we've made a very conscious effort in our training program to seek out and recruit uh, as diverse a set of individuals as we can. Neurosurgery is not necessarily known for being the most diverse specialty, but we've tried in our institution to make an effort to bring people in uh, from as many different backgrounds as we can. We feel that the variety of viewpoints enhances the program. We feel that our patients want to see people in neurosurgery who look like them. We feel that uh, training these folks is both better for the specialty long term. It brings issues forward within neurosurgery, care gaps, and other, and other problems that maybe a lot of us don't see. Um, they allows us to reach out to populations who deserve better neurosurgical care that maybe we otherwise wouldn't reach out to. Um, and I think it's made our program stronger having these folks involved. Now that said, I think once you do that, I think it's important to make sure that as the faculty and the leaders of the department that you create a space in which everybody feels comfortable expressing their opinions. Um, certainly as, as some people um, look around the room and see that maybe not a lot of other people in the room look like them, they may feel reluctant to express themselves, to uh, express uh, what they feel is going on, especially if it may be a contrary opinion. Maybe they feel they would manage a patient differently. Maybe they would feel in an, in an M&M conference that they might be more critical of something that went on. And I think it's important that the senior faculty come out and maybe uh, set an environment up, maybe solicit these people's opinions openly if they feel that they're being a bit, if you feel they're being a bit quiet in a meeting, if you're sitting in a case and maybe you're with a diverse set of trainees, you actively turn to a trainee and solicit their opinion, ask them a question, ask them how they would manage this, um, or really try to bring them out so that eventually these folks feel comfortable expressing themselves and stepping forward to the forefront, because those are the people we want to train, right? We want to end up having people who feel confident enough uh, to be leaders in the field. And the only way to do that is to make sure that they understand that they deserve to be there. I, I think those are some excellent points. You know, I, I think that we can all relate to being um, first only different, whether that's because of our gender, because of our ethnic background, whether that's because we're, you know, a physiatrist versus an anesthesiologist. I think the fact that we can all recognize within ourselves that we have felt as a first only different and we have felt like we were an imposter is very pertinent to your point dr rosenau that we have to acknowledge that we've seen this in ourselves and those of us who are training other physicians or have junior colleagues we have to be on the lookout to recognize how people may be embracing their social norms around them and may be impacted by this and internalizing this and feeling like an imposter. So I think you're absolutely right. We need to change that social norm atmosphere um, for those around us. And with that, Jasmine, can you give us some, some positive um, concepts to take away, um, you know, to kind of pull everything together here? Sure, absolutely. First, again, I just have to say thank you all so much for your vulnerability. I understand um, particularly detailing the experiences of your own imposter syndrome and the environments in which triggered that is really difficult. And so I applaud you all for your transparency and your vulnerability in this space. Um, so I definitely want to reiterate, before I go into these takeaways, I want to reiterate Dr. Hunt's point about differentiating between imposter syndrome and discrimination. So imposter syndrome is certainly rooted in the historical exclusion of many marginalized communities like women or people of color, differently abled, first generation college students, etc. Um, and thus, it creates othering in the workplace. However, the basis of imposter syndrome isn't solely bias and discrimination. So please don't use these tips and think that they apply in discriminatory environments. You certainly cannot positive affirmation yourself out of discrimination. Um, so I definitely want to flag that before getting into these tips. Um, so for my first tip, um, these are going to be thinking about if you are experiencing uh, imposter syndrome. So the first thing is embrace the feeling. It is absolutely okay 
to have a moment of doubt or anxiety or second guessing yourself. Embrace the feeling, acknowledge it, but also separate feelings from facts. And this is something that comes out of a lot of the psychological or psychology literature, but we know that feelings are not facts. So you can absolutely, it is totally okay to feel inadequate. It is totally okay to feel as if you don't have the credentials or the expertise to be in the space, but also know that that is not true and it's not fact. And in most cases, you are beyond qualified. You have all of the credentials plus some to be in that space. So it is okay to acknowledge the feeling, but also recognize that feelings are not facts. The other thing is to pinpoint the trigger. And that's really important because as I noted, uh, imposter syndrome is context and time specific. And so don't feel as if like, oh, this is, I'm always going to feel like an imposter. And every time I'm entering a new situation, I'm going to feel a, like a fraud. It's important to pinpoint what is the trigger? Is it a questioning? Is it the environment? Is it a moment where I feel like I didn't get enough sleep the night before? And, and when you are able to pinpoint the trigger and identify it, you're then able to articulate the feeling in a more um, direct and explicit way and ask questions and take steps and actions to address the actual trigger. So please make sure to pinpoint what it is and recognize that in the different spaces that you are operating. And then the last point is to get an accountability partner. I think a lot of folks have already highlighted this on the call, whether it be a mentor or um, a, an advisor of some sort. I definitely utilize an accountability partner. Um, right when I started my PhD program, um, I recognized that I was not speaking up in class a lot. I was coming from a non-sociology background and so I felt like I was just wasn't tooled with the language and the abilities that some of my other colleagues were um, tooled with coming from a background and an undergraduate degree in sociology. And so I definitely saw myself and I recognized that I wasn't speaking up. I didn't feel like my contributions were valued. Um, and another student noticed that in me as well. And so after class, and we were the only two women in my cohort, after class, she was like, we are shrinking ourselves in this classroom. So we have got to hold each other accountable. And we, come, we came up with a plan that we would say at least two things in class during the duration of the class and we held each other accountable we would sit across from each other in class and say like okay i said my one thing what's going on like it's we only have 30 minutes left you need to be saying your thing um and the reason why that's important is that as you speak and you hear yourself speak and i think a doctor um said this before it's like we are our worst um critic in our own head but once we say those words it really um diminishes the power of that critique and those negative thoughts but hearing yourself speak in spaces makes you realize, I absolutely deserve to be here. So having an accountability partner that will hold you accountable to speaking, to probing, to asking questions are deeply important. And then I want to shift really quickly to the organization and to um, the structures and as a leader in an organizational space. Again, as an organizational scholar, I focus on the organization because imposter syndrome, again, has nothing to do with the individual and everything to do with the structural um, place or structures in place that allow for othering. Um, so if you are a leader and you're seeking to address the imposter syndrome, one thing you can do is amplify positive affirmations and the positive things about your employees. So before you even ask a question, say, you know what, let's take a breath because you absolutely know this, like you've got this. Um, you are a top graduate in this program. You were the number one resident in this in your residency, like you've got this, you know this, take a beat and then let's like answer the question. And so amplifying positive affirmations when um, people are doing great and performing well in your um, teams, making sure that you highlight those things. Um, creating a space for psychological safety. So psychological safety is the belief that you won't be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, or mistakes. So psychologically safe environments encourage challenging the status quo or voicing dissenting opinions without fear of repercussion. And psychological safety 
in the workplace combats imposter syndrome by creating a space for employees to feel seen, heard, and valued for their unique contributions. So try to make sure that you're creating a space that encourages questions, that encourages risk-taking, that encourages and celebrates failure. That is where innovation is at its highest point, is when people can fail, learn from that mistake, and then continue to move on. Um, that is where we see innovation thriving and we see folks are combating imposter syndrome. And lastly, um, making sure that you reevaluate the workplace environments and practices that trigger othering and imposter syndrome for underrepresented employees. So one of the things that we talk about, um, there's a lot of physical um, things that trigger imposter syndrome, but there are lots of, lots of symbolic um, ways that imp and trigger imposter syndrome. So in particular, um, when you walk into your workplace and their pictures, perhaps of the board of directors or former employees, who do those pictures look like? Do they actually look like the employees that are working in that organization? Are, am I, as a black woman, able to look up on that wall and see someone who looks like me and therefore makes me realize I belong in this place? There's someone who looks like me who is successful and thriving in this place. Um, so diverse representation in the workplace, making sure that there are platforms for all voices to be expressed and heard are really important. So it's not only just the physical um, and the psychological uh, you know, safety in the workplace, there are also these symbolic elements that are often unseen and you know, unheard, but they exist and they are ways that can either really bolster belonging and inclusion in the workplace or trigger psychological or trigger imposter syndrome if you don't feel represented in that space. Awesome. Dr. Sanders, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Um, because, you know, looking at imposter syndrome from an institutional organizational level is just so important. And thank you for those tips. I think that your your help tonight really weave together the experiences from, from many of our panelists. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. And I'd love to thank all of our panelists for having the courage to share um, their stories and to be as vulnerable as they were with us. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons and, and apt to Dr. Sanders' words is that we need to see people who look like us on the podium, you know, in journals, presenting at conferences. And that's one of the reasons in clinical practice and research that's why we have women in neuromodulation um, as a committee for NANS. And I encourage those of you who are, who are out there who are not yet members for WIN or who are not yet active to you know, send myself or to send Adriana an email um, you know, expressing your interest. We have some spots that are uh, available on the board and we would love for you to get more involved. I'd like to lastly give a, a very special thank you to um, Adriana, who is part of the NAN staff, who has done a fantastic job in helping us put this together. Um, certainly, without her help, we wouldn't we wouldn't have had as as an amazing uh, turnout as we did today. And I want to thank you all for attending and listening, and for sharing your comments in the chat and questions. Um, and I'd also want to say that we look forward to seeing you in May at the next Winning Conversation webinar, where we're going to talk about career development and actually have um, advice from a contract lawyer regarding contract negotiations, both in the academic and the private practice setting. Awesome. Have a great night. Thanks.